Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Crick. I remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to another rendition of WTR, aka... Was that real? This is where we look at TV shows that are forgotten by some, but remembered by others for just how strange they were. And I apologize if I don't exactly seem like I'm on top of things. I haven't slept in a bit, I haven't shaven or anything like that. It's just that, um... The character we're gonna talk about today, I've had a few, uh, run-ins with. <laughs> yeah, so, when I heard I was gonna talk about his live-action series this week, I just wanted to take the proper precautions. <laughs> like I said, little on it. As some of you know, Teddy Ruxpin was a disturbing hellspawn of a toy that was one step away from Skynet watching your kid. It was supposed to be comforting, but it scared the shit out of every parent who bought it. Even Robin Williams made jokes about it. You couldn't do cocaine, there's a Teddy Ruxpin doll. It's the type of doll you think that when you fall asleep, the doll wakes up and goes, You must kill my man, Daddy. <laughs> so it only made sense to have this terrifying Teddy Nader seem even more alive with the live action show. Though, to be fair, this is only really a pilot, and even then, not technically that. You see, they want to do a live-action series based on the stories that your robot was reading your kids to bed with. But when they shot the first extended episode, it proved to be too expensive. So they eventually turned into an animated series, and this ran as the ABC Movie of the Week. Because wouldn't you want to look at this before going to sleep? The funny thing about it is that in a strange way, you can see why it was so expensive. I mean, nothing looks realistic per se, but it does look like the toys literally started walking giving our therapists countless hours of employment. One of the reasons is that they got a pretty big name and effects to do it. Lynette Eklund has practical effects credits under her belt like Beetlejuice, Pee-wee's Playhouse, the Jurassic Park sequels, Honey, I Blew Up the Baby, and is even commissioned for some impressive cosplays. So like I said, the props and designs, for a kid's show and what was required at least, are pretty impressive. But that doesn't mean the show is, well, good. It starts off in the realm of weird when horrifying Mama Bear is singing a song to baby Teddy. I think she's literally holding a Teddy Ruxpin doll. Come dream with me tonight. Did you enjoy your breaded Goldilocks? Mine was too cold. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. And in case you're wondering, no, she serves no purpose to the story whatsoever. We see she has a map and an amulet, but she never does anything with it, and Teddy says no one in his town or family ever goes on adventures. He doesn't even mention her giving it to him or anything. Iliops aren't very adventurous. At least they haven't been for many generations. Man, if I had this shit the whole time and never utilized it, I'd be pissed! Yeah, I'll dedicate my life to you, you little bastard. I could have been treasure hunting and making millions, but instead I'm raising your dead-eyed ass. You better live out my dreams, you demonic rabbit's foot. We cut to 15 years later, where we see Teddy and his caterpillar friend, Grubby, clearly caterpillar milk has a lot of growth hormones, out to find themselves that treasure mentioned earlier. You didn't tell me that adventure seeking would be this hard on my feet. I don't know, Davy. But they come across other rejected Mario World characters who try to eat them up. Whoa! They're going to catch us! Run faster, Grubby! I'm trying! I'm trying! Well, they would catch you if they didn't just stop at the camera. Maybe they saw a salesman selling hands so they can have an activity to do before going to bed. Think about it, you'd be pissed off if you were them too! But they come across an old man who saves them. This is your generic bumbling inventor who's so traditional you could just call him Gimmick. You can call me a uh, Gimmick. These are my kids, Pawn and Tool. But it looks like an evil villain named Tweeg is also looking for the treasure, as his plan to turn buttermilk into gold doesn't seem to be working. To actually make gold out of buttermilk. I, just, I can't imagine why not. He seems to be the villain in all of this, but much like the mother, he seems entirely pointless. He's always just off to the side saying do and curses. Even when the heroes are right in front of him, he doesn't seem to do anything of threat. He is, without a doubt, the world's worst uh. shot. <laughs> He's kind of as ineffective as the Grinch, if he shaved and ate the voice of Captain Hook. I've always known he wanted to steal my formula. But the inventor uses an airship to travel to the treasure while these beaked testicles voice their disgust. Tilt I, I knew it! Well, that seemed needed. They crash into a tree where a fairy, who I swear sounds like Judy Garland on Quaaludes. And I suppose there's no such thing as a big bag of air stuck in my tree. 
And is it me or is her knowledge of technological aviation pretty damn advanced? You do understand the simple basics of aerodynamics, don't you? In order for your airship to move in any given direction, you must apply a force in an opposite direction, such as in this large manually driven propeller. Then you will have to know something about the effect of wind and various aspects of navigation. Christ, did you teach at a community college? I know it's like she flies, so she would already know something about it, but then again, she flies! Why would she need to know anything about it? Oh well, maybe this awkward, overly long goodbye scene will make up for it. Bye! Jesus, the ending to Return of the King said goodbye faster than this! But they come across rock biters, turds, who decide to put Grubby to work but place the others in the dungeon. Put this one to work, and take the other two to the dungeon! Man, I know that's a prejudice of some kind, I just don't know who's supposed to be offended or why. They're locked up with a guy named Prince Aaron, who is looking for his kidnapped sister. Because naturally a prince would do so on his own and have no qualified professionals for the task. I've been here for a long time. But they escape and agree to help Aaron find his sister. This leads us to a giant purple monster who wants to help. You say a princess? How come she's lost? Well, actually she's been kidnapped. Why would anybody kidnap a princess? That's bad! I mean, from a storytelling perspective, it seems so tired and cliched! Hey, Timon! We're on another royal forced bloodline again! He advises them to see the wizard, who it turns out is just a faker using lights and projecting effects, which leads them to a giant castle where they dress up like soldiers to save a girl. I think we all know who needs to do some proper suing. You gotta get out more. I love the fact, by the way, that the wizard lets everybody in except the purple monster. He doesn't even give a reason! You stay outside. The rest of you, come in. Why is prejudice so bizarrely okay in this world? It's okay. He actually loves purple monsters. You can tell by this post with him eating purple monster food. Twig also arrives there as, what a coinky dink the treasure is there too. They're landing! Why does it always have to happen to me? <gasps> They're landing. Did he just howl like a wolf, or did somebody open a box of Cookie Crisp? Cookie Crisp! They all sneak in to try and rescue the sister. And we've been ordered to take her out of here. Just who orders you to take her? Oh, um, um it, it was, uh... Get him! Oh, General, get him! Great man! Play tennis with him on Tuesdays! Whoa! So in a scene I still don't really get, they connect the medallion saying only the pure spirit may find the treasure of knowledge. This leads to a bunch of treasures being revealed, but they instead take these crystals that each have a word written on them. Honesty. Bravery. Trust. Friendship. Wind. Water. Heart. Go planet. Let's go. Hey LB, where do you suppose they're going? And what are those things they're carrying? Those are excellent questions we are refusing to answer. Enjoy what we wrote on our lunch break. Of course, the treasure disappears for Twig because... Something about being true to your bullshit, I don't know. And they get back safe. The brother and sister go home, Grubby does this uncomfortable hand gesture, and we get another overly long goodbye as they sail to Ronald McDonald Land. Then the wondrous dream we dream tonight Someday just might Come true. Rest your arm, you weird people! So it was... about what you'd expect. It's difficult to be hard on it, as it's clearly meant for little, little kids, and again, for the budget they probably had, the puppets are pretty well done, as well as some of the sets, but it is what it is. A good meaning, but still creep-inducing show that'll happily haunt your marijuana high for years to come. But at least now you know it existed, there was probably a fair amount of work that went into it, and it's... moving pictures with sounds. You gotta give it that, it's moving pictures with sounds. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, and... I'm going to leave very quietly. There was no
no danger. I was building all that up for nothing. <laughs> That's life. Coming next week is the review of Wild Wild West. Yeehaw! But you can see it now under Vessel's ad-free early access. Just $3 a month to see tons of people's videos early as well as a bunch of other extra features. Check it out and get the early scoop. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. This week we are not doing the Ron McDonald House, though it's also a good charity. Uh, we are doing Scholarship America. This charity's mission is to mobilize America through scholarships and educational support to make post-secondary success possible for all students. Their vision is to be the nationally recognized leader in providing private scholarships and other financial support to make the completion of education beyond high school a reality for everybody. They believe that every student deserves an opportunity to go to college, regardless of their financial status. In 1958, an optometrist in Fall River, Massachusetts had a simple but profound idea. If everyone in his community gave just one dollar to an educational fund, it would be enough to help nearly every student in the community attend college. Since its founding, Scholarship America has distributed more than three billion dollars to two million students across the country through various programs, including dollars for scholars, dream keepers, and scholarship management services. Now, in their second half century of helping students, they invite you to become a part of their mission by donating or volunteering. You can see all the great work they do on their website, or you can hear the stories yourself on their YouTube channel. These are great people that do great things, and everybody deserves a great education. Go to their site, see the great work that they do, and check them out.